Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. I apologize uh, for my lateness, but I suppose uh, when I uh, speak of my pretext, uh, some of you will be more understanding. I'm, uh, I just got back from Turkey uh, uh, on my way to Italy, uh, and uh, uh, tonight I have to be in class. Uh, very soon I will uh, be asking you uh, to be excused, so I apologize for that. Uh, well, women in Islam, uh, I'm not a theologist, uh, I'm a, uh, a politician slash an academic, a person who uh, basically uh, took her political experience um, to a next level and tried to think about uh, the uh, political matters in a more theoretical context and came into the field of political science quite late in her life. So uh, let me be excused. Let me just present that disclaimer from the get-go. Um, since I'm not a theologist, also I am a practicing Muslim, I'll try to approach things from more pragmatist as well as theoretical perspective and leave the um, uh, difficult job to my sisters when I sneak out from here. Well, uh, indeed, we did usher into a new world um, with September 11 attacks and uh, here we are. Islam is at the very center of our uh, global, national and local discourses. I know that that's sort of reflected upon me in the classes I teach here at Elliott School of International Affairs that we have to put a cap on classes because political Islam and terrorism and, and Turkey and European Union are uh, sort of very interesting subjects uh, uh, for the the American people. Um, indeed, it was a tragedy, but after um, this many years, maybe if we really try very hard to find something um, that uh, came out as good out of that tragic experience might be that inner energy that American people have and the curiosity they have about Islam. One thing, knowing the Occident and Orient, being a citizen of both the Occident and the Orient, I have an ability, I suppose, to compare and contrast. And I have to say, I cannot take for granted uh, the, um, uh, the eagerness to learn, uh, the greatness of uh, admitting what we do not know in this part of the world and rolling up the sleeves and getting to work of learning about what we do not know rather than just chanting about what we do not know. So here Islam is uh, on our agendas. Uh, indeed, the larger context that we discuss Islam is if it is compatible with democratization, uh, if the values of democracy are compatible, are uh, engraved and embedded in the very values of Islam. And in this very city, there are many people who are uh, on opposing camps as far as this question is concerned. Rule of law, accountability, transparency are some of the things that we'll, uh, we, we brush aside and do not look. And what we see today in the Muslim world uh, from Tunisia, uh, up down to Yemen uh, is a, a very clear indication that we have been ignoring what was going on there. Uh, that is the lack of rule of law, accountability and transparency. Here it is, it is even affecting us today. Um, but more so, we're more interested, uh, if you will, uh, in subjects of human rights as far as Islam's discourse with democratization is concerned with a specific reference to women of Islam. They're different, they dress differently, so they're to an extent weird looking, and therefore uh, they raise the eyebrows and, and they are in a way a closed box for many. And therefore, the interest and curiosity comes there, so uh, as uh, the prejudices and misconceived conceptions about it. Uh, about the issue of women in Islam, I think I can approach it from two perspectives. One is um, a very theoretical discussion on women in Islam. Uh, the other one would be Muslim women in Muslim world, or Muslim women in the diaspora, Muslim women in life, live and kicking. 
Um, as far as women in Islam discussion is concerned, uh, indeed, um, from the tradition that we are coming from here in this very part of the world, we're looking for some uh, uh, traces of egalitarianism that Islam does not necessarily give to us. The kind of egalitarianism that we might be expecting uh, from uh, Islam, the kind that uh, you might see in 21st century some of the Western societies, not all, that is, indeed, is not something that you can see. So, in order to approach to the question of women in Islam, first we have to divorce ourselves off of the trappings of our Western construction of 21st century egalitarianism. Uh, we can talk about compatibility between men and women, indeed, uh, but not egalitarianism as we understand here. Uh, we can talk about equality, division of uh, responsibilities and so forth, uh, but uh, not necessarily egalitarianism. We can talk about being at the very same distance to the Lord as creatures of God, as men and women, but we cannot necessarily talk about egalitarianism. Uh, a second very hot topic, indeed, her, uh, her, her uh, hijab, the international word, I suppose, her scarf, as far as I'm concerned, because I'm coming from Turkey, and then the veil. Um, uh, uh, let's not mix all of these up to one another. The word hijab is not necessarily the word that is uh, uh, pronounced by Quran, but um, we see that it is so ubiquitous to the extent that it became the international rather English word, even if it might be very foreign to some of our cultures. So is the veil. However, veil is indeed the one that covers the face. Uh, which is an addition which needs to be applauded from my perspective. Uh, I'm a woman who does not necessarily veil, uh, who does not think that women should veil, but indeed a person who respects women who veil is none of my business for that matter. But whatever it might be, the covering of the Muslim women. Um, uh, this is one hot topic that brings that strangeness and brings out the very Orientalist assumptions engraved in our Western world uh, for centuries. <coughs> uh, it is there. Uh, uh, that's uh, one of the subjects that uh, heeds quite a bit of attention. Uh, under the subject of women in Islam, uh, hijab, uh, as far as... Uh, I am concerned, as many of the mainstream Muslims are concerned, is a farz, is an obligation from God. <clears throat> Indeed, there is a minority view that the particular verses about uh, the covering of Muslim women should not be interpreted in the way to cover the hair, head, and the neck, and so forth. That's a minority view. Um, but the general view that it is farz, it is an obligation on women. And indeed, Islam uh, is not an exceptional case. Uh, there is, from the perspective of Islamic credo, uh, there is one God, one message, and therefore, uh, the message that was revealed to Moses, peace be upon him, so as the message that was revealed to Jesus, peace be upon him, and to Muhammad, peace be upon him, are the same message. That's why you have Jewish women, Christian women, and Muslim women who do cover, and then Jewish women, Christian women, and Muslim women who choose not to cover. But this is not an exceptionality to Islam. Women, from the perspective of our Lord, must cover, uh, but it is our decision to go ahead and abide by that law or not. Coming uh, to more uh, uh, practical aspects of a religious discourse, when we look at the Muslim world, uh, indeed, Muslim world uh, treats 
Muslim women's treatment in the Muslim world. Indeed, uh, we cannot uh, deny the repression, oppression, and discrimination that takes place against the Muslim women in the Muslim world. Um, uh, some of that uh, repression, oppression, uh, has to do, uh, do with the fact that women are women. So they are not exceptional to the Muslim world, but to be a woman at this time and age in any part of this planet is not an easy job. Uh, and therefore, there are many commonalities between the challenges of Muslim women and the challenges of Mus women who are not necessarily Muslim. Then there are some uh, uh, areas uh, of repression, oppression, discrimination, whatever you'd like to call it, challenges that Muslim women face due to some of the particularities of the Muslim world. That's another area that we love to talk about and uh, air on our channels and so forth. Um, the reasons, if we are going to be concerned and concentrating on that latter part, the reasons for them might be enumerated in a very brief manner um, as such. Uh, uh, there is a, a parochial, patriarchal interpretation of the very cradle of Islam. Uh, there are some movements uh, around the world uh, uh, led by uh, female Muslim scholars uh, where some of the areas that fall under these categories of parochial interpretation of religion are divulged and talked about. Uh, and here I put my disclaimer that I do not necessarily with everything that these um, uh, scholars of the East and the West promote, but I find uh, uh, worthiness and I find quite a bit of validity in some of the arguments that they bring uh, forth. Um, Islam is a way of life, and you are very, very familiar with this cliché, um, but it is a necessary cliché. Um, it's a way of life. It is one religion that has not been one Abrahamic religion, one religion that emanates from Lord as we understand in Islam, uh, that uh, has not uh, experienced a period of reformation in the way that Christianity and Judaism have. Uh, from the perspective of Islamic credo, uh, Christianity and Judaism, uh, the messages that were revealed to Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them, have been tampered to an extent, and with that tampering came the reformation and secularization, and therefore privatization of religion. Uh, from the Islamic perspective, you can look at it as a marginalization of religion as well. In certain aspects of daily life, religion is there. In other aspects, it's not there, if you will. But Islam is not like that. Uh, for one thing, Islam takes very much pride in the very fact that it has remained authentic and unchanged. To some, this is very obsolete. From the Islam's, Islamic and Muslim's perspective, this is something one needs to take pride in because the original message remained uh, uh, the same. And in there, uh, indeed, uh, Islam regulates every facet of your life with no exceptionality. That is very mind-boggling to some of my students for the past eight years that I have been here at GW. Uh, for a secular mind, or for a secular construction of the Western mind, maybe not all, but some, it is mind-boggling to understand that a religion can be regulating every facet of life, day in, day out, without any minute of exceptionality. And indeed, with this, I will put this uh, rather provocative adjective out to you, that Islam is very disciplining and intrusive. Intrusive. It regulates your life. 
It brings a discipline to your daily life. Therefore, there is an Islamic way to pick this up, there is an Islamic way to write, there is an Islamic way to hold the microphone and an un-Islamic way at the very same time. The caveat that comes with this intrusion is that, not that I'm complaining about it, it makes it very easy for one to be a Muslim. It's all out there, you just try to abide by the laws and regulations, but the caveat that comes with that is that uh, Islam is not the only thing that regulates our life. Culture is another thing our local culture, our American culture, my Turkish culture, the Egyptian culture, and so forth, the Indian culture, is very much part of our daily life as well. To the extent that these two entities, religion, credo, as pure as it is, as pure as it is supposed to be, theoretically speaking, is so much intertwined to our local culture, they become inextricable, to the extent that we don't know quite why we do certain things. Is it the culture or is it Islam that mandates us to do what we're doing? And sometimes we do things that are antithetical to our religion, but we think we must do them in the name of religion. Um, and these are the rather cultural things. But who you think would be to blame when this is aired on Fox News it would be indeed Islam, not the local culture. It would not be the fault of Fox News not to know that, what's from culture and what's from Islam, let alone Fox News. The Muslims themselves do not quite know which one is from culture and which one is from the uh, tradition of Islam. Uh, so that's one point that creates quite a bit of challenge for Muslim women. Um, um, there are certain parts of uh, Indian society, for instance, where divor divorce is not acceptable. Divorce is halal. Divorce is permitted in Islam. Look at the tradition of the Prophet of Islam, their wives and the companions. However, you can have and test your, some of your uh, Indian American friends. In their family tradition, divorce would be a no-no sort of like um, uh, some other uh, uh, sectors of Christianity. Why? Because prior to Islam coming to India, the, the tradition of Hinduism does not necessarily accept divorce. But for a person who does not quite know about Islam would think that uh, generally uh, that is not permitted due to Islam. So uh, it is uh, an important caveat to make distinctions between culture and the credo. And then I need to uh, end my um, uh, remarks uh, uh, with a, a little touch upon uh, on the secular oppression of Muslim women. We feel sorry for Muslim women being oppressed in the Muslim world, but it is not religion always that oppresses or the religious people who oppresses Muslim women. Uh, it is the very secular states of Turkey, Tunisia, for instance, France, um, if you want to keep France out because it is not a Muslim country, try to explain what happens in Tunisia and Turkey as far as the women's coverings are concerned. So Muslim women ha do have their own challenges from the um, parochial interpretations of religion, from uh, the interpretations uh, that are bequeathed from uh, uh, culture, and then the very secular states who do not leave these women all alone to themselves, but decide for them, for them uh, what they should be wearing and what they should not be wearing. Um, this is where I'm going to end. I hope uh, that uh, I brought in more questions to your minds than the time that you came in. If I did, uh, I think I would have done a good job. Thank you. <laughs>